Hi, and welcome to Drafting Compliance. I'm Kane, he's Tom, and we talked about the changes in FedRAMP Rev 5 last time. Today, we're talking with Matt Fryer of Infoblox based on a conversation we had about the costs of FedRAMP. But before we get to that, Matt's brought in a favorite beer to share. What are we drinking today, Matt? We're drinking Modelo, the favor among the South Texans. Okay, now I notice you, okay, Tom and I have got it in cans. You apparently have it in a bottle, Matt. Um, that's a di- that's a distance here, from is source. Not gonna, not gonna fit again at all, as usual. Uh, though I am gonna try. I'm gonna crack um, it. Yeah, I think we should definitely crack it. Take a sip, see what it's like. Uh, what type of beer is this? It's Modelo a special. It's a, it's, um, a, it's a traditional Mexican lager. So those who Mexican drink, lager. yep, those who drink pilsners, this will be very similar to an American pilsner. It'll just be a little, generally a little more malty. Um, okay. It's been a while since I've had a Modelo, but I've had quite a few Modelos in my day. So, Matt, what and do you it, like about Modelo? It's the 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 on the back porch while you're grilling in this Texas heat, kind of eating. It's it's just it pairs well with the food that I tend to eat in the South, right? So we eat a lot of Tex-Mex, we eat a lot of red meat, right? And, and whenever we drink, when you drink a Modelo, it pairs really well with that meat itself, and it also doesn't land too heavy in your stomach so you can keep eating all the food that's delicious yeah that's a that's, at the same time that's an upside that of any promising. of any lager and especially mexican lagers right they're usually lower abv so i think this is 4.4 percent so it's not like some mm-hmm. of the ipas that hit you hard um and it's not super i can also full say body. that this is um very clear like compared to some of the things that we've had on the show tom this is very clear i can actually see it's got little bubbles still consistently rising i mean they're not exactly champagne bubbles but they're they're bubbles yeah uh you know this this isn't going to have the nose that any you know of today's craft beers have this is a no, mass produced mexican beer it just smells like beer yep um, that's what you're going to get yeah, out if of I was it. to think of like beer i would i would think get of this smell sort of bready greeny mm-hmm. smell but that's about it and the head's kind of gone down too after a bit so we're going to tr- you probably already taken a sip haven't you yeah uh, i'm going to yeah. have a go and see what it's like Wow, I'm impressed with, by the lack of face that you, you're giving. <laughs> oh, it's got a, it's got a thing on the back of the tongue. Like up till that point, it was fine. Yeah, it's pretty. I mean, um, compared to what we normally drink, Kane, this is pretty. This is pretty thin. It doesn't coat your tongue. You know, it, it. It's it's meant for you know probably somebody who's going to drink two or three rather than just one, right? It it's Did it's not going to hit you hard. These? Oh, I could in my day, I could definitely drink three or four or five of these so but uh yeah it's it's you you mentioned something on the back end i'll be honest it leaves my palate pretty quickly so i don't i don't notice much on the back end but it's super easy to drink kind of a sour flavor but not it's it's kind of you're right it is gone now so other than that you know one lingering aftertaste it seems inoffensive (laughs) so far Uh, as usual we will test it again at the end of the show matt and uh, get our our ratings and our reviews as well as my thoughts on how the beer has uh, changed flavor and as to tom as to whether or not he's had another two or three while we're recording which i think is going to be a lot of fun actually we should do that for one of these um (laughs) But we're here to talk about FedRAMP, and um, Matt, from a cost perspective, you know, Tom and I understand this, I think some of our viewers do too, like getting FedRAMP authorization isn't a small feat. And before we started recording, you'd mentioned a range of $2.5 million to $3 million over 18 to 24 months. Can you expand on what those costs typically cover? Typically, you're going to see that experienced in your control stack. Uh, the security control plane is going to suck up a lot of that cost where you're trying to add additional controls. You're trying to add additional configurations or additional features. Um, and on top of that, they're not just being able to say, I need to go add a, a new ITSM tool or control into the stack. And that might cost X, Y, and Z. But whenever you're taking a look at FedRAMP itself, you're having to go add that ITSM control that now has an authorization. And typically, you're going to see an upswing in the actual control cost between your traditional commercial version and your actual FedRAMP ATO version of that exact same control, where they have to strip it down and make sure it adheres to the same ATO, ATO control standards that you're trying to adhere to. Right? So everything in that control stack still has to have an ATO, just like you're trying to obtain. So you're going to see that uptick in the controls itself. 
Um, and then, and then when you start looking at some of the processes and policies that you got to update and draft and the work factor that goes into that, you're going to suck up a lot of FTE time and actually drafting those things, executing those controls, um, actually doing all the configurations on the back end that you have to do. And depending on your approach to that, you can get a wild swing. So I've seen a lot of customers just actually take an entire instance themselves and say, okay, we're going to do a separate and apart instance. And then they can do that to control their cost and do the things that measure those and fixate it in and of itself. But when I've also seen those customers do it in the same control plane, the same, no isolationism, no separation, they're doing it in the same stack. That cost can get exponentially higher depending on how you deploy it. The two and a half to three million is kind of that measuring point. If you were to silo this out, create its own instance, deploy all new controls, write new processes, create, you know, go bring those FTEs in that can actually write the processes and policies that adhere to what the AT, what the PMO is looking for, and then actually doing all the configuration changes along with it. So you're looking at in 18 to 24 months is pretty aggressive for a lot of organizations because this isn't typically considered standard process for them. It's usually a secondary project or a secondary thing that they're working on. It never really takes that priority level unless there's a contract driving it. So I've seen it go 18 to 24 months. I've seen it go three to six years. It just really depends on how they prioritize it. And the longer that runs out, the more cost you throw at it. I can't help but notice Tom's reaction on this one because I don't think we communicated uh, 2.5 million to 3 million and I don't think we had a goal of 18 to 24 months. I think that if I recall, Tom, the, the, the goal was to do one season of drafting compliance about FedRAMP and then move on to another one. Yeah, <laughs> that's correct. I mean, we, we set a target of one year. That's really one year to ready. So it's not ATO. So we essentially have divorced ourselves of the of the gap that is going to be the federal government's process um, as much as we can. But our process is a year long. That said, you know, there's been enough bumps in the road already that, uh, you know, I think, Matt, your your timelines and your in your sense of dollars are probably going to be for the most part what uh, other businesses will see. Right. One of the things that I saw as a as a big differentiator on cost is the age of a company and the amount in the amount of legacy debt that you're taking on. Was was that something that you had to consider heavily in your environment, Matt, or is it? Are you like us, where everything was fairly new and fairly best practice as you know as a greenfield build, so we didn't have any of that legacy. You're you're not going to run into a whole lot of just brand new greenfield build. Um, you're typically going to run in a lot of what I've seen in CSPs. A lot of what we've seen uh, on my side is it's legacy stuff that's being built out. It's legacy technical debt. It's legacy uh, application that you're trying to deliver. Legacy le legacy delivery that you're working with, and that it carries a big load of, of uplifting legacy into what you need it to be. Right, you're going to see a lot of people really struggle with legacy stuff and just as simple as FIPS, right? Getting yeah, FIPS compliant with a legacy platform is yeah, tough. There's a lot of costs. Right? Uh, yes, FIPS validated versus FIPS compliant. Oh my goodness, yeah. that's that's a thing. Um, but Matt, it sounds like you, you've got some some experience here. So let's talk about making those estimates a little more actionable. So tell us about what steps you've taken for helping cloud service providers make more accurate business projections while they're pursuing FedRAMP authorization. Typically, we're going to evaluate their maturity levels, right? We want to understand where they're at in their security maturity and then where they're at in their compliance maturity, right? So a lot of organizations, especially ones that are chasing that, that ATO, some of them just don't understand there's a complete different separation between someone's security maturity and someone's compliance maturity. There's a conflation there where if they think they're compliant, they're secure. If they think they're secure, they're compliant. And those typically don't run hand in hand. They're usually separate and apart. Right. So what we try to do when we're giving them that that feedback of how do we how do we accelerate is where you are in your maturity program, because we can find those areas to accelerate. If you don't typically if you typically have a less mature security program, but you're more mature in your compliance program, we can create acceleration in the documentation and process and policies phases because you have the resources and experience to execute on those things pretty quickly. Um, if you tend to be more secure, secure, mature, and you tend to have more technology um, maturity than, than maybe compliance, you can probably speed up and create a path on the technology track where those controls become easier for you to execute and easier for you to get control of. And it really just depends on creating greenfield or creating or uplifting, right? There's two different paths there, and we want to understand what that organization is trying to do because each one of them is going to face a different hurdle with FedRAMP. And 
what what you create a streamline in, where you create efficiency and speed to market in, depends on that organization itself, right? Where are you? Where are your strengths and where are your weaknesses? Everyone's going to fall down. Everyone's going to have something they struggle with. Let's figure out what you're great at, and let's create the efficiency there. Let's create the speed to market there, so you can get that ATO. We typically, in my past, have worked backwards from what their driving factor is. You know, why are you seeking an ATO? What's the reason for that? What's the timeline of that? And let's work backwards from that to figure out what we need to do. Do we need to go third party, hire somebody out to build a technology stack on a complete greenfield so you can import the application into it, right? Or do you have a runway long enough that we can actually do it in-house and create an in-house program where you're building it all yourself and you're hiring in those people in and you're doing those things within your own organization? It really just depends on how fast you're trying to get that ATO and what's the driving force on it. More often than not, I'm telling a lot of those CSPs, like you want to contract out as much as you can. It's a fixed cost. You can control it. You can hold accountability to it. It's really easy to hold that out. So if you can contract it out, contract out the writing for other policies and processes, you'd be surprised when you're ready and you're submitting to your auditor, your 3PAO, and you're trying to get all that stuff done and audited and completed, how they see things and how the PMO see things. There's a complete separation of experience between those parties, right? If you don't understand what the what the PMO is asking for, you may be rewriting things several times. So where you want that efficiency to be and how fast you need to get there will really determine where we find the, the speed in the runway, right? One of the and things Tom, said- we've chosen to take this on internally. <laughs> <laughs> well, largely. I mean, we we Large. have yeah, we have certainly leveraged both our client base and our trusted partners in terms of of you know speeding things up. So to say we are alone on an island would be in, inaccurate. But we certainly are not pulling in a bunch of FTEs. Although, <clears throat> Kane, we we do have a a sense of a plan that we could speed things up by bringing in some externals here in the next few months. So we're, we're looking at that currently. One of the things that you said, Matt, I thought was particularly um, important, and I think we should not marginalize the comment at all, is there is a difference between compliant and insecurity, right? Oh, yes. And yeah. w- what I have seen in numerous organizations that I've walked into is folks that go, well, we're, you know, we have a SOC too, so we know we're secure. And the reality is, is compliance is a waypoint on your way to best practice. And if you design your information security that way, knowing that you're going after best practice, but you have to keep compliance in in mind as you get there, you're going to be in a better state down the road than than these companies that just go after a SOC too. So I think that's really yeah. smart. Yeah, yeah it, I, I do think that is a material consideration for a lot of organizations where, um, and I think that also affects supply chain decision making, where companies will trot out a SOC 2 as evidence of, of security and no, that is not evidence of security, that's evidence of compliance. But yeah, I want to go back good. to something that Matt had said about um, business level segmentation of either trying to do one compliant environment that is fed ramp as well as compared to doing two separate environments, one that's like commercial, one that's oriented towards fed ramp. And I've tried to counsel organizations on both when I've done executive advisory work before. But Matt, from your perspective, when, when companies are resisting segmentation at that business level, what are some of the most frequent reasons that you hear? I hear a lot of resource constraints is usually one of their top reasons that I tend to hear is like, hey, we don't have the resources to maintain two different environments or we don't have the resources to build out two separate environments. Right. That's usually a big contention. A lot, And the other one I tend to hear a lot is is legacy versus greenfield. Right. It's like, hey, I have this legacy platform to rebuild this all over again. Just takes too much work, time and effort. Um, that tends to fall back on that resources problem as well, where it's like, hey, I just don't have the resources to go rebuild the application. Um, and they tend to fall into that trap. And I, I, I tend to call it a trap just because of, of my perception of what best practices is when it comes to FedRAMP ATOs and how you build out that environment, how you maintain that environment, the right, in my perspective, the most efficient way. And when I think about efficiencies, you know, sitting in a CISO chair, you think about efficiencies in a multiple multiple different ways, right? So I think about efficiencies not just from an operational side of the house, where I'm trying to create operational efficiencies that can be work factor, that can be process and policy, that can be a lot of different factors that come into my operationalization. But I also think about a financial efficiency standpoint, right? So am I using the resources in the right way? Am I using my controls in the right way? Am I using 100% of those controls? Am I using a control more so than I need to? So I have a lot of those factoring coming, those factors coming into my decision on, on separation between having it lifted of an environment or building out a brand new greenfield environment. 
So I, I tend to counsel a lot of the customers that I'm working with, a lot of the executives, a lot of the CISOs and GRC groups that I'm working with on the difference between Greenfield and, and Uplift is help them understand the risks that they're running into because the business decision isn't always uniform, right? So um, we have customers that you have to understand, right? When you're building out this environment in this ATO, when you're doing and releasing new features and subsets of features for this platform itself to your customers, right? It's not the same between your two, between your commercial customers and your federal customers, right? You have to go through a significant change process with your federal customers. You can't just roll out new stuff and hope that it's the government's okay with it, right? you're gonna have a hurdle. And for most organizations, they don't understand. Like that's SEO is like six months. Like you're gonna have to submit the same change, get it approved, go through the process. It takes some time to get that done. So you can't just roll out changes every month like you would typically do for your commercial customers. But are you willing- Not yellowing stuff into production. Not that that ever goes poorly for anybody. No, no, (laughs) never. But then at the same token, it's like if you're going to hold your commercial customers to that standard, right? Are your commercial customers' expectation the same as your federal? Because if you're going to go tell them, well, I, I'm not going to roll that out because it takes me X, Y, and Z amount of time to get that rolled out. Well, your commercial customers might not have an appetite for that, right? So you have to take a lot of this stuff into consideration. The same thing goes for the control stack, the technology stack, from a financial efficiency standpoint. Do I really want to pay for an ato SIM for everyone? Right. Is that really something I want to pay for, especially on a consumptive model? Uh, geez, that's, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to consume significant. Cost. Most of my consumption is going to be huge on the commercial side versus the federal side, which is a much smaller consumption rate. Right. So it's like, I don't really want to pay for, you know, we'll use Splunk as the example, right? Because Splunk's probably the most common consumptive model we can think of. Do I really want to play, pay the Splunk Gov version <laughs> of Splunk? on that consumptive model for every customer I have? Or would I just say, okay, well, I have, you know, we'll say VA, I have the VA and I'm gonna use it for them. But it'd be significantly cheaper to just to deploy that in an isolated environment to your cost. And imagine that across all the controls that you need for an ATO. So it's like, you have to take those factors into consideration whenever you're deciding, do I, do, do I go Greenfield and separate or do I, do I uplift, right? So it's, it really is up to the organization on how they want to handle it best. The, the, the biggest constraints that I hear customers say they don't want to usually don't pan out to the to a business decision that drives the right outcome you're looking for. So I don't have resources. Well, you can contract that out. That doesn't, that's not a good reason to say, hey, I'm just going to uplift, right? Yeah, There's that's a lot short-time of thinking, right? Short-time thinking, yeah. not long-term thinking. You know, one of the things you yeah. danced around a lot, in, and I probably want to pull into this conversation, is there <laughs> there is a potential skew you're adding with a with a FedRAMP program too. So there is a potential to, to claw back a bunch of the cost that you've put into the program with the, the uplift in, in terms of your cost structure around the Gov piece. It takes a significant amount of resources, time, money to maintain that environment in Gov. Y- you can be expected to be compensated differently for that skew. Yeah, you're going to see CSPs uplift that cost out because it's just a POAMS part of that environment you have to do every month, right? That's maintenance part of it's painful. You have to deal with that. So you're going to charge more for it, right? Consider that. Are you going to charge more for it to just the federal government or are you going to charge more for it for everyone across the board? Because the reality is everyone across the board is going to have to go through it whether you want them to or not because all of that cost is going to be sunk against all of them because you've, you've created this commingled environment for yeah. all of the controls to live within. So it really just becomes that. And you're right. You're going to charge more because it costs more. Uh, the federal government's perfectly okay with spending more. Are your commercial customers perfectly okay with spending more? Right. That's, that's the questions you have to ask yourself from a business side of the house. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. And I think that you, you talked about a number of controls there, um, fin- both, you know, people process as well as technology controls there, Matt. Um, mm-hmm. Are there any controls you've seen consistently overlooked by uh, cloud service providers that are, that are working towards FedRAMP? <laughs> they always overlook FIPS. I don't know why. Like every single time. It's <laughs> seems like, going to be that one. Yeah, it's the one that always gets overlooked. And they go back and they're like, oh, am I FIPS? Am I aligned to FIPS? Am I FIPS compliant? You know, it's like, no, no, you're not. More often than not, you're not, more often than not, you're not going to be in line with FIPS. And it, I, I promise you almost every single time our customers get that I've seen that I've consulted with a lot of the executives that I work with, they get hit by that every single time. 
It's like, well, I wish I had known I needed to be Phipps. It's like, well, <laughs> pretty clear in the documentation. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty clear. Yeah, I, I think um, that's pretty clear. And just for our viewers, Matt, is it Phipps? You have to be Phipps validated, or you have to be Phipps compliant? It's going to be Phipps compliant. So it's the one forty dash two. So you have to be Phipps compliant. Um, it's still painful. <laughs> validated versus com- validated versus compliant. There's a little bit of difference there, um, minorly if you know the difference, but it's still, I still have to go through the compliance side of it to be adherent with the, the, uh, the, the compliance side of it, the actual, now the word escapes me, I'm sure you can cover it off on the game, but um, to, to adhere to the specific standards for FIPS, um, when a compliance standard rolls in, you still have to do all those things. You still have to be part of it. And the, a lot of these legacy the 3KO is going to be looking for evidence of that as well. That's the other thing yeah. is like, you can't just tell them, yeah, it's totally FIPS fine. No worries here. Like you actually have to show them configuration yeah. evidence that to your 3PAO is part of getting ready. Correct. Yep. And then the PMO is going to want to see all that. Like it isn't, mm-hmm. like, and the PMO is going to validate it against what the 3PAO gives them. Right. So uh, it's, it's, it's a three-step program where it's like, I got to be ready so that I can be audited. My my three PAO is going to audit me so that I can go to the PMO, and all three of those steps are going to be validated that the, you are compliant with this. So absolutely, Tom, we're good on that one, though, right? We are good on that one. That's that's <laughs> that's, that's that one was, of the that's one that's good. That's one of the benefits of a of a fairly greenfield build, right? I mean, yeah. we're a five year old company. Um, really, three years is the majority of our controls have been put in place in the last three years. So it's it's all been built to best practice. So there's not a huge uplift there. The, our biggest gap is, you wouldn't be surprised here, Matt, but is documentation, right? So uh, we built it, now we have to document that we built it. Yeah, most, most legacy platforms that are trying to strive to FIPS compliance usually isn't about the FIPS compliance and the application. It's how that application is working within its environment, within its platform, right? Yeah. So how does it communicate with all the different modules in that boundary? That's where they run into it. It's like, oh, well, this sucks. Like, you have a big issue with getting everything to work together within that FIPS compliant manner. Yeah, so. That's right. All right, and and so you've talked a little bit about like um, the controls and some of the gaps and some of the segmentation and business level decision. So, from your experience, Matt, how do businesses justify that large financial and time investment required for FedRAMP compliance? Uh, usually with contracts. Um, Usually what you're looking at is either you have organizations that are trying to create entry into the federal space and they're saying, hey, I can see a need within the federal space for what I'm providing, right? And you have to have market cap there to actually justify that need. Um, Typically what I've seen is there's a government agency that is seeking out what you're doing, right? So I need that service or I need that application. I have to have that for my functionality. Right. And those contracts um, can be very lucrative, They're very, very lucrative for the most part. I think the, for the most part, the smallest contract I've seen on first annual returns, like, you know, seven million. Right. I think it was one of the smaller ones that I've seen. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, if you have one of the government agencies offering to buy on a contract first year, seven million dollars for the application that you're running, that two to two and two and a half to three and a half million dollar investment on a seven million dollar return. Doesn't makes make so perfect sense. On investment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's. Yeah, I think what we struggle with is when we're talking to you know the board or we're talking to the C-suite and we're talking to those in to, to the executive level or the board level, trying to get that that support from them in order to drive that initiative forward is helping them understand what the time is on that. That's the part that really a lot of them struggle with. Is like, oh, I'm gonna go spend three million dollars. How long is it gonna take me to get there? And how soon am I going to see that return from, you know, that $7 million contract return from the federal government? Right? How long does that take? And I think what we what we have to do as part of that initiative or that project is, one, get there as quickly as you can. That's the first and foremost thing, because as soon as we can start seeing those dollars come across, the better. Two, don't start the project and don't kick off the cost until you have a time frame on contract execution, right? So we don't want to go spend two and a half, three million dollars to go get, come, go get our ATO and work towards that ATO to know that the contract is gonna take five years to commit or whatever. You wanna make sure you're lining those timeframes up to where you're finishing up that PMO, right? Or you're entering the PMO when that contract is being executed, right? So a lot of organizations, a lot of uh, CSPs tend to think that I have to have a full on PMO, I have to have full on stamp before I can go get a contract, mm-hmm. which is just not true. Like, not you true. don't need that stamp yet. You just need to have a 3PAO signing off 
with a plan and an execution path to present to that agency to show them like not only am I getting compliant, I'll be there by this time frame, and they'll issue a contract off of that. They don't need you to be all the way there for the most part. They just need to you need to demonstrate to them when you will be. So yeah. lining all those time frames up is kind of critical to making sure that the, you get that buy-in from the executive team and from the board to say we're willing to put money into this so we can get that return on investment. That's going to be the biggest the biggest hurdle is trying to get that support from that executive team on that project or that initiative, but delivering them the value points and timelines that make sense for that you know seven to fifteen million dollar contract that you're going to get from the federal government for that. You've got to line it all up for them to make it make sense. Otherwise. I mean, realistically, if I'm a CISO and you bring that to me, I'm going to delay you in that contract. You know what I mean? <laughs> Matt, where I'm, where I'm seeing a lot of organizations fail is they don't understand how important the feeder of the sales process is into your mm -hmm. FedRAMP program. Me meaning that, you know, the board executive management is saying, oh, we can't wait till we get there. When the reality is, is the sales motion and getting that plugged in is a piece of getting there quicker. Not only that, but if you're... Yeah like us and you're going after an agency sponsor rather than the jab, that sales function is gonna help you capture that agency as well. So not plugging that in early into your function is a mistake in my mind. It should be part of the business strategy to build out the organization to chase that, right? And it's for multiple reasons, right? So you need the funnel, you need top of funnel being driven, being pushed in so that you have sponsors, you have opportunities there to, to, for that project to execute properly. But at the same token, no, no one really wants to go jab until they have to. Jab is a lot tougher, right? They're only going to review so many a year. You have to have you have to demonstrate a governmental need across multiple agencies for what you're trying to do before they even consider you. So for the most part, the desire is to go agency routing and sponsor through. So you have to build out the organization on the front end early on with that sales development cycle, with those familiarities, those relationships. So you can get that top of funnel to say, hey, you know, I I know the I know the government agencies. I'm here to sell it. I'm here to push it. Don't I'll, I'll I'll set whatever expectations I need to on the operational side for how long it's going to take you to get there. But you should early on have a program of people in place that are going to go chase that opportunities down for you because it's going to take some time. It's not something that happens overnight. For you're dealing, in a lot of times, on. you're dealing with the federal government, which we know isn't yeah. isn't speedy. They don't move. So. They don't move fast. Uh, <laughs> and half the time you're dealing with federal agencies, like it's it's crazy because I've dealt with like the VA is probably the big one I deal with the most, right? In my past, they, they issue the most out, right? They're just the busiest. Um, they're also the least familiar with veteran, right? So you just have to understand that even the agencies you're working with, right? They don't necessarily understand their own compliance standards as well as they need to. So you're going to have to help them get across the finish line as well. Right. So it's like one agency within the VA may understand it perfectly well. Well, agency B in the VA doesn't have a clue what it even means or even how to spell it. Right. So you have to understand the dynamic there. So when we say build it early, that's what we mean is because if you're going to chase those agencies down, they may just say, you know, there are definitely DOD agencies that are just buying stuff and saying, hey, here you go. They don't understand that you need to have an impact level authorization to just to actually use the product. But they just want to buy it. Right. Yeah, so that's right. Having that. Salesforce and that, that team in front, driving that and providing that information to those agencies and helping make sure it's successful that they buy it. Or the other part of it is just as important as actually building out the operational side of it. And if you're enjoying our show today, do ring the bell and subscribe to get new episodes or search for Drafting Compliance in your podcast app to listen along. Matt, with our remaining time, I want to ask a couple follow-on questions about the um, the challenges that you might have noticed in CSPs, cloud service providers, who are transitioning from traditional IT governance models to what's required by FedRAMP. The biggest challenge is the documentation side of the house, to be honest with you. A lot of the CSPs, they're used to doing their own kind of you know processes and policies that they put in place, and they never really document them that well. Right. And so when it comes time to evidence that out, they struggle really, really fiercely with that. Right. And that's the part of it they got to get really good at. That's the bone they have to build. That's the muscle they have to get worked out well. Um, you're going to with with the continuous monitoring requirements that you have to do in place. Like you're going to have to get good at that. Like you're going to have to exercise that muscle and get good at documenting, get good at projecting, get good at executing that process and policy around just remediating vulnerabilities alone is going to be um, arduous if you're not good at it. For the most part, vulnerability management in most organizations is not a facet of your security program that you exercise frequently. Usually it's like, hey, 
Microsoft has an issue. Let me go patch it. You know what I mean? That's usually what you're dealing with, right? It's the vulnerability management stuff is usually the lowest hanging fruit that has the least, least amount of risk to your organization for the most part. You're mostly dealing with zero days or different intelligence vectors. You're usually dealing with those stuff in security. So vulnerability management just kind of takes a back seat. Well, when you're dealing with FedRAMP, it's a front seat, right? That's that's core and tantamount to your con continuous monitoring program. So that's right. a lot of them are gonna deal with, with a lot of that kind of documentation stuff and executing um, some of the, the evidence that you have to do uh, month in and month out for, for just the continuous monitoring part of it from your policy and program perspective. Tom, any thoughts on that? Well, my, my one thought is, you know, I've seen lots of organizations that have a vulnerability management program, but they they look at it as a Microsoft only problem, and it's not. <laughs> it's it's yeah. a much bigger problem than that. So, to your point, I, I think in a lot of organizations, it takes a back seat. It should take a much much more prominent front seat. It's one of the lowest hanging yeah. fruit. To your point, Matt, that you can do in any organization. So, FedRAMP or not, vulnerability management is critical, and and we should treat it as such. Certainly in FedRAMP they're going to bring a level of diligence to that program that I think most organizations are just not prepared to, to shoulder. Right. And that's, and that's your point. Yeah. yeah. It's like you get hit with a critical vulnerability in most organizations. They don't typically respond to that very quickly. If they do, don't get me wrong. We do. We respond to it quickly. They just don't respond to it as quickly as FedRAMP asks you to. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. That's where they tend to fall over. It's like, Oh, we have this critical vulnerability. How quick do we have? And it's like, Oh, we're already out of time. Right. 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 So, right. Well, so I think that with just one last question, Matt, before we get to our beer reviews, and I'm, I've noticed my glass versus Tom's glass this tends to be the typical problem that we have here. Um, but Matt, <laughs> would you say there's an area in FedRAMP that you think could be optimized or streamlined to make the process easier for cloud service providers? Uh, from a... From a development and building standpoint, you're, you're going to drive optimization through automation. Right? You're going to use um, e either either process really. I mean, where can you where of, can you drive right? optimization? There's a lot of, into lot of companies out there that help out with that. Well, they actually have the expertise on this is the configuration go. Right, a lot of them will have just straight out rollout programs where they can roll out the entire technical stack. Um, the management side of the house is a little bit tougher. Um, that's an FT, so you have to create templates and processes to drive that quickly and have dedicated FTEs that know how to do it and do it well. Um, that's where you're gonna find that efficiency going from a management standpoint. Operationally and just standing it up, it's leveraging the, the products and services out there that you have at your disposal. Fantastic, okay, well, um, I think at this point we can probably get to our beer reviews. Um, Tom, I, uh, Matt, I can't help but notice like, um, yeah, I don't I'm even gonna, know if you, I'm gonna try I don't another. Even, if you've even sipped on it, Kane. I put the rest of the can in the in, in the glass. <laughs> so did I. I. to make it fit at least. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, Tom, do you want to lead with your review? I know this is one of Matt's uh, favorite beers for recommending. I, I will lead. That sure. looks like a glass of scotch you got there, buddy. I got to tell yeah. you, that looks like a really big glass of scotch. Yeah, that's a three finger. So I'll say this. You know, if you if you, what you want to do is is sit on your back porch after you mow the lawn and drink something that is going to go down easy, and you're still going to be able to get up afterwards and get some more work done. Modelo is not a bad beer to drink. It it's in line with much of the sort of the Mexican lager world, so you can't go wrong with one of these if that's what your desire is. If your desire is to get a bunch of character in uh, something different and unique in your drink, don't go to Modelo. That's not what they're that's not what they're about. But, you know, in terms of my rating, I'm going to give this, uh, for what it is, I'm going to give this a seven. So it's highly seven. drinkable. Okay. If that's what seven I want to drink, that's what I'll give it. Okay, fantastic. Well, I'm going to go next, and then we'll let Matt finish us out on, on beer reviews. Um, I am going to take another sip of this and, and uh, see if the, yeah, now it actually smells a little more um, like biscuits, actually, is what I think of, like fresh baked biscuits, which is not an unpleasant smell. Um, yeah, and yeasty, I'd say. Uh, in terms of flavor, you know what? If you leave it out, if you just leave it out and sit <laughs> and uh, and do some Fed ramp work, actually, I think that this is a fine. Um, you could accidentally grab one of these and you wouldn't spit it out. Uh, at least I don't think that I'd accidentally grab one of these ever. But uh, if you did, right, if you're at your desk, you're doing your FedRAMP work, you've got a beer next to you and you were to grab this, it wouldn't be 
offensive. I think that this might be the strongest review that I, I give to a beer yet. Um, I have had worse tea than this. I can say that. Wow. I have definitely had worse beer than this. Um, I'm going to give this a five out of 10. Wow. In that it is inoffensive. It is um, free of a lot of the crazy stuff that we've had on the show so far. So turns out, Tom, look at that. Like we're 20 episodes in and uh, we found my first five out of 10. Um, Matt, Knowing that you like this beer, you may have some some bias there. Uh, how would you rate this on a uh, on a out of ten scale? I probably put it on a six or a seven, like a six ish. Um, it's a like I said, it's a great backyard beer. Where if you're just trying to sit down and drink a beer and kind of enjoy the afternoon, um, it's not one that I would sit down and kind of pull a cigar out and kind of enjoy the beer. And, and it has a unique palate, a unique flavor to your palate. I wouldn't call it that. I think it's a great backyard beer if you just want to have something for an everyday kind of grill some fajitas and and mow the yard and kind of drink some beer while you're doing it. It's probably a great beer for that. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't rate it on the top end of kind of the top top beers that exist. Fantastic. All right. So I, uh, I think we all came in fairly close on this beer, actually. Well, with that, I want to thank Matt for being on the show. Again, if you've enjoyed today's show, Drafting Compliance, please do like and subscribe. Look for us in your podcast app and leave reviews. We do enjoy reading those reviews. And if you've got questions about FedRAMP or if you'd like to be a guest on a show, either leave a comment in the comment section or reach out to us on LinkedIn. With that, though, I want to again thank Matt from Infoblox for joining us today. Tom, great seeing you as always. And with that, we're out. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.